Welcome, everyone. Welcome back. I'm glad to see people have survived all the physical activities of yesterday. Any broken bones that happened? No? Good, good. So I'm Janet England. I'm a professor of pediatrics at the University of Washington in Seattle, and I'm interested in vaccines and in, in high risk and special populations, including pregnant women, immunocompromised patients, and uh, others. So I'm going to start now. It looks like almost everybody is here. I am so grateful to not be after lunch. This is just lovely to be talking. Everybody's awake and alert. So if I could have the first slide here. Ah, so welcome. Thank you. I'm going to talk about immunization in pregnant women for the woman, fetus, and infant, which not, is not exactly the talk that was assigned to me, but that's what I'm going to talk about. Um, because I think it's really important when we talk about this that we're not just talking about one specific um, issue. So with that, I'm going to start, and I have some conflicts of interest. My main interest is I've really been interested in RSV for the past 35 years, so you're going to hear a bit about RSV today. And uh, my, my institution has received research support from various people I've consulted for companies. And most importantly, I support influenza and COVID-19 vaccination for healthcare workers, including pregnant women at my institution, and have done so for the past, well, not COVID, but for flu, for the past 20 years. So in our institution, pregnant women get immunized, at least healthcare workers. I'd like to start out with the challenges for maternal immunization, just so that people don't think that it's easy to be doing studies in pregnant women. It's not simple, it's not easy, but it is certainly rewarding. And I compare it to climbing Mount Everest, which I have not climbed, so I just want to make that clear. Um, but it is difficult, and if you are going to climb to the top, you certainly have to be prepared, you have to do exercise, you have to have help, and you have to have the correct supplies. So just keep that in mind. I acknowledge a whole lot of people from my institution, from Vanderbilt, Baylor College of Medicine, the Nepal group out of Johns Hopkins, and then lastly, Claire Ann Segrist, who you met last week, who is really, um, I'm totally grateful to her for starting talking about maternal immunization at the first, at the second ADVAC back in 2021. We have really been talking about this for a long time before anybody even knew what it was practically. Um, with that, I'd like to define it. Maternal immunization is giving a vaccine to a pregnant woman, we say now pregnant person, sorry, to provide protection to the mother, the fetus, and the infant through active antibody production by the mother and subsequent transplacental antibody transfer. So this is what I'm talking about today. Um, what we're trying to do is close the window of vulnerability in the infant. We're trying to protect the mother. The maternal antibody is going to go up usually about two weeks after a vaccine. And then there's a period where the infant may have maternal antibody or may not have maternal antibody. And if there's a lot of maternal antibody, like in the right-hand side, you can see that the, the period where the infant has little antibody is, is narrowed. What's the rationale for maternal immunization? I think you've all heard some of this already, so I don't want to talk about it, but infants are at high risk. Active immunization really rarely works for infants. If I had more time, then we'd start talking, what, what vaccines do we give to infants at birth? So I'm going to ask, what infants, what vaccines do we give to infants at birth? BCG, HEPI, and what else? Polio. So we do that. And, and we do that, you know, the immunologists can talk about it. We do that because it works. And we don't do it with DTP or HIV or other vaccines. And do you know why? Because it doesn't work. Um, you can talk about the immunology. There's a lot of reasons, but we've tried it. It hasn't worked. So for some things, we really want to do maternal antibody. And what we do know is maternal antibody can be boosted during pregnancy to provide protection. Now, I'm going to start by saying this is not new. I am not a new person doing this. It's been going on for a long time. Certainly, it was even done with smallpox way back when. Um, there's also protection of the mother that can help the baby. If the mother doesn't get smallpox, the baby's not going to get it, as well as antibody. So there's two reasons why we, maternal immunization can work. But in 1970s, we started doing tetanus toxoid immunization. 1980s, really in the United States, maternal immunization stopped except for tetanus um, for home births. 2009 was really the rebirth of maternal immunization because why? Because we had a huge mortality in pregnant women with the 2009-10 pandemic H1N1. 
Then again, in 2012, we started having and remarking on pertussis epidemics, at least in the UK and the US, and that emphasized the mortality in infants. And finally, in 2020, with SARS-CoV-2, we really noticed, again, increased mortality and certainly increased morbidity in pregnant women. So the objectives of this talk is to talk about the rationale, how antibody transfers across the placenta, and then I'm going to talk about specific vaccines. And since you know I don't have much time, I'm just going to give a little brief overview of the vaccines. I think it's important to know that there's lots of vaccines that can be applied to maternal immunization or have been applied to maternal immunization. And I'd just like to say... I'm going to start with diphtheria. And we heard, it's very nice because you've heard about many of these vaccines already, perhaps not in the context of maternal immunization. But diphtheria in the 1950s was a very deadly disease. In fact, in the 1930s and 40s, it was a deadly disease too. It was always pretty deadly. But by the 50s, we had a toxoid vaccine. And we were giving it to both pregnant women and babies. And so we'll go on. So here's the current status of vaccines. You have this in your handout. I'm not going to go over it. I'm going to talk about many of these vaccines. But if you look at the vaccine benefits, um, and I don't know how to use the pointer, but anyways, anyways, if you look at maternal benefits, you can see there's maternal benefits to, to basically all the vaccines except for possibly RSV. And for that, I would say there's also a benefit. It's not a benefit protecting from death, but protecting from infection. So why are we really hounding, why are we thinking more about maternal immunization today? I think in part it's because antenatal care is becoming more commonplace and more important, at least through the WHO and increased provision of care to pregnant persons around the world. We want to increase antenatal care visits. We think that's beneficial for the mother and for the baby. And we know now it's not just the number of antenatal care visits, I mean, it's really nice to go and have an antenatal care visit. Some of these women wait in line for five hours to be seen. But if they're not checking their blood pressure, perhaps doing a physical exam, these visits are worthless. So it's really important to have a quality um, antenatal care visit. And with these antenatal care visits, it gives an opportunity for vaccines, especially tetanus vaccine. So how does antibody get across the placenta? It's very interesting. It is not passive transport. It it doesn't just diffuse across the placenta. And of course it can't because there's seven layers of the placenta. It's not not going to get across just by being there. It is active transport. It grows across the placenta via via the FCRN receptor, the gamma receptor, in the syncytia trophoblast cells. It goes across the chorionic villi. And then when when the chorionic villi, villi get an acidic pH, it can be released into the baby infant fetus circulation. And I think it's a really remarkable, um, teleologically, it makes a lot of sense how clever of the, of the endosomes to do this. And it works well. It starts really probably around 18 to 20 weeks gestation. So it starts early. And by the time the baby is born, if it's born at term, we actually can have 120 to 150% of the maternal antibody in the baby. And that's because it's active transport. So you have to know it's active transport. I think that's on the quiz. um, So what affects active transport? Well, you can imagine if your placenta doesn't work well, you're not going to have good active transport. What can make the placenta not work? Um, Placental abnormalities such as malaria, HIV, having a poorly a mother in poor nutritional health. The time, if you give the vaccine a day before the baby's born, it's very not giving the the mother much time to make antibody to get across the placenta. And then it also depends on the maternal IgG level because there there is active competition between the different IgG molecules that get across the placenta. Um, The subclass matters, IgG1 and IgG3 are preferentially transmitted. But if you have a lot of IgG, if you live in a country, and the studies have been done all over, but especially the Gambia have have had nice studies by the Kim Mulholland and his group, showing that if there's lots and lots of IgG, you will have competition for that IgG to Hib or tetanus to get across. And uh, so I think it's really important to know that it's not too simple. And what a study, a nice study in, in South Africa has shown 
that the gestational age of the baby matters, perhaps because there's more time for the active transport to occur. But if you look here, looking at the ratio, the red line is the ratio of fetal to maternal antibody. And you'd like it to be 100%. You'd like 100% of the mother's antibody to get to the baby. I would like 130%, but 100% I, I, I'm okay with. And you can see to these various antigens, measles, mumps, rubella, and varicella, you can see that by the time the baby is over 36 weeks gestation, on the far right of each of these four bars, the black, gray, light gray and white, you can see that, in fact, the baby is getting approximately 130, 150% of the antibody across. But if the baby's born less than 28 weeks, yeah, not so good. What about HIV? This is a big concern when we talk about um, maternal immunization. You can see here on the right-hand circled area that maternal immunization is decreased about a quarter, 25%. So if the mother has HIV under poor control, and of course, there's other factors, nutrition, TB, malaria. But if you have that, you re reduce um, transmission of maternal antibody. Now, I'm going to start going through this whirlwind tour of all these vaccines that have ever been done. And don't worry, it's, it's going to be brief. But I just love some of these studies, which just prove that, in fact, I am not saying anything new and anybody could stand up here and give this talk. Because Miss Molly Barr, a nurse did some of the landmark studies in the 1950s with diphtheria toxoid vaccines in pregnant women and babies. And she published a series of three or four papers in The Lancet. She got to be first author, but they called her Miss Barr. You know, so uh, nowadays, I don't know, that's kind of interesting. But what she showed was that infants were protected after maternal immunization in London. That's great because in London, they were having diphtheria outbreaks. But she also showed that if there was more mater maternal antibody, when the infants got the vaccine, they responded less well to the vaccine. And it's taken us 80 years, and we're finding the same thing. We're going to see this again and again with Hib, pertussis, some other vaccines that we're using. What about tetanus? Neonatal tetanus is certainly a preventable disease. It is so important to notice how, to know how important it was early on. In 1980, um, a good study said that 30% of all deaths in the first year of life in many developing countries was due to tetanus, 30%. And this was not just Africa. This was Thailand. This is Haiti. This was South America. There's a lot of tetanus deaths. And be, if any, how many of you see, have seen neonatal tetanus? Anybody? The back of the room, the old, old people in the back of the room. There's some younger people in the front of the room. Okay, good. And middle-aged people. Okay, we've all, we've seen, but it's, it's like, it's unmistakable. You can't, I'm, I'm just saying, it's not like RSV. If someone has neonatal tetanus, it's pretty obvious. And that's, therefore, I believe a lot of this data because it's a very um, characteristic disease. And, and generally, people die from neonatal tetanus. Nowadays, not everyone, but most. In 1961, they did a landmark study in Papua New Guinea, in, not in Papua, but in New Guinea, looking at the benefit of maternal immunization with tetanus toxoid, which showed protection of the mothers and, un, and, and the lack of tetanus in the babies. Just an inc incredible study. And following that, there was lots of work, and I just am putting some of the highlights by WHO and UNICEF with setting the goal to eliminate neonatal tetanus, which has been procrastinated upon, but we've, we keep on setting the goal, and we're almost there. Um, in 2022, 47 countries have eliminated maternal neonatal tetanus compared to 2000, so we're doing well. Um, we have 12 remaining countries with tetanus. You can look on the right-hand side. Those are the red countries. And, of course, we probably don't capture all the deaths due to neonatal tetanus because if a baby's born at home and gets sick, we don't necessarily capture. But still, we are making great progress, and UNICEF is really helping lead the way with WHO to, to really immunize pregnant women multiple times with each pregnancy. And the other approach is to doing adolescent immunization to make sure girls are getting immunized um, so that they potentially have antibody before they even become pregnant. So pertussis, moving on to pertussis. Pertussis disease is most important in infants under three months. We've had outbreaks, as I said, in the UK and US. We have recommended a cellular pertussis vaccine for maternal immunization. If you look on the right-hand graph, in the UK, they have beautiful epidemiology showing the increased rise in the top blue line is babies under three months with pertussis. And you can see when the maternal pertussis vaccine was introduced, the incidence went way down. Now, of course, pertussis has seasonality, and there's, you, you can discuss this however you want. But maternal immunization in the U.S. and the U.K. had statistically significant and 
really um, prolonged reduction in, in, neonatal in neonatal pertussis. And so here, nowadays, you can see the countries with recommendation for pertussis immunization during pregnancy as of 2020. And there's a lot of countries that are routinely doing um, maternal immunization with pertussis. And they are doing it with an acellular pertussis vaccine combined with diphtheria tetanus because there is no single yet monovalent pertussis vaccine. When should you give it? Well, um, as you'll be hearing soon from Christiana Eberhardt, but she and Claire Ann have done a really nice study showing that the earlier you give the vaccine during pregnancy, the better it is. And this has been duplicated with some beautiful studies by many people in, um, in Belgium, in Vietnam, in the United States. We have a lot of data. So giving it earlier is better. The timing is kind of a political say as opposed to a scientific say, at least in the United States. Um, we don't give it till later, and that's some of us think it's a mistake, but at any rate, we give it usually after 20 weeks gestation. And what does pertussis immunization do on infants? In infants, um, you can see that sometimes it can decrease their antibody response to their first immunization, particularly if they're on the EPI program at 6, 10, 14 weeks. There's some concern of interference, but what you can see is they really are prime. They really do make an antibody response. It's just less. Um, and if a booster dose is given, which is not typically given in many um, low and middle income countries, but in the United States, for example, with a booster dose given, the antibody results after the booster dose are the same with maternal immunization as without maternal immunization. So flu, I really want to make sure and talk about influenza. We're going to hear more about influenza. But it's quite clear, based on data going back many years, over 100 years, probably going back not just to 1918, but to the 1890s, we know that flu disease during pregnancy is bad for the woman. There's increased severity disease. Um, there's especially increased severity of disease with underlying conditions. If a person has um, underlying heart disease, lung disease, um, immunological disease, those people suffer the most from flu and there's increased severity with a new strain. And this is, this is great. When I talk to medical students these days, they don't even remember 2009. So do you guys remember 2009 pandemic H1N1? How many of you were in medical practice or seeing patients? Okay, so a lot, but not everyone because I'm dating myself, okay. But pandemic H1N1 was really terrible and, and people, some people were shocked <laughs> that it was bad on pregnant women. That means we don't, learn from history, doesn't it? And also it can impact the fetus and especially impacts the fetus if the mother is 20 weeks gestation, gets the flu and goes into preterm labor. So, so it does impact the, the pregnant person, the fetus, and especially with new strains. So um, with data available, the WHO made a position statement and this was um, Kathy Newsel and I were, and others were on this, Claire Ann were on this, were on this committee that the flu vaccine for pregnant women is based on scientific evidence. It's based on a high risk of severe disease, safety, and effectiveness. And that is scientific reasons. I think there's, there's really good rationale for doing that. These studies were subsequently proven in some Gates Foundation um, studies conducted in Nepal, Mali, and South Africa. Each um, prospective either double blind or um, placebo controlled studies, which really showed that laboratory confirmed influenza in the mothers and laboratory confirmed influenza in the infants could be reduced by giving flu vaccine during pregnancy. Good data, big studies. Each study was, was about 4,000 um, pregnant persons. And now I just wanna give you this one little update. I think now we can use really cool new immunological techniques to really show the benefits of influenza and why are we getting the benefits of influenza immunization, not just in the mother, but the infant. And using a, a, a system called system serology, which really looks at, at 96 different profiles of different antibodies. And I, I can talk about it at the coffee break. But um, Galit Alter and her group have really helped show, using some of our Nepal data, that maternal influenza vaccination induces innate immune functional antibodies. It's really interesting which antibodies um, are induced. They are transferred across the placenta, as they should be, 
Um, and antibodies that, re that bind the FC gamma receptors really protect the babies from flu. So we actually know which kind of antibodies are most protective. Maternal vaccination induces the antibody quality as well as quantity. I just give this as an example that high quality science is ongoing, and I don't have time to talk about it for the other vaccines, but it's just really exciting to see maternal immunization moving into the 21st century. So here's a case presentation. Your patient says, I don't believe in vaccines when you offer a flu vaccine to your pregnant patient who's 24 weeks gestation. And just pretend you live in a country where there's flu vaccine available. And what would your response be? And would you have a different response in a pregnant versus a non-pregnant woman? Anybody? How many would have a different response if the woman was, were pregnant as opposed to non-pregnant and she's 30 years old? Would you have a different? Okay, so the few are going to have a different response. The back row and the back of the room. Okay, the front of the room, you guys are not going to do anything, right? <laughs> not good, not good. Okay, well, the answer is yes. You should be saying something different because... First of all, the main reason for a woman getting a, a, a flu vaccine is really to protect their baby. Pregnant people do not really care about themselves. They care about their baby. They will do a lot to protect their baby. And if the advice comes from their medical care provider, whom they have seen before or whom they trust, that will work even better. So the main reason is to protect your baby from flu. And that is something we who do health care and do public health should be mentioning. We're doing it not I mean, yeah, we're doing it to protect you. Really, I'm doing it to protect you. But I really think the reason that you, the pregnant person, should consider it is because we want to say to help your baby. And there's everything else. It's con con convenient to get the flu vaccine. That's a crummy reason, but it works. Um, so there we go. Um, moving on to RSV. I want to make sure I have time to talk about RSV, my favorite virus. Um, the recent advances in RSV prevention are huge, and it's too bad. We need to have an RSV lecture like we have some of our others, but then they might cut down our 25 minute talks further. But I wanna just say there's like several great new findings with RSV, happy to talk about this further. But there's new findings about the RSVF prefusion. I think we're gonna hear more about some of that from Barney Graham. We heard about it last night on the COVID vaccine. The advances in RSV technology were crucial to make the COVID vaccines because we understand the structure of the F protein. Um, and the stabilization of this by using three disulfide bonds to make the F protein stay in the pre-fusion form as opposed to the post-fusion form is really important. This is the pre-fusion form, the globular form. And the red part, this is really important. The red part, you can sound really smart, is site zero. This is the active antibody part. And all of our new vaccines and monoclones are directed against that red site zero. So that's a very important thing. That's that's remarkably important. But what else do we know? We know that there's good transfer of maternal RSV antibody across the placenta. It's about 105% at term. Now, this isn't new. Paul Gleason, my mentor, <laughs> reported on that like 40 years ago. And um, we also know that we have long-acting monoclonal antibodies. Before, we had to give a monoclonal antibody at least every 28 days. And now we can give it once and it will last six months. So we have incredible new and interesting, important things. So maternal immunization to prevent RSV. There's the most urgent need to protect it during the first few months of life. Mother can transfer IgG. Newer vaccines are safe and effective in old people, in women of childbearing age, and now in women who are pregnant. And um, a lot of studies have been done to show that it's safe during pregnancy. So there's challenges. Is it generalizable to all populations with HIV, with preterm infants? Lots of challenges here. When should we give it? What trimester? Um, what safety do we need to evaluate in babies? And how efficacious is it? So with clinical trials now completed, I can answer some of these questions. And I'm only going to talk about the one most recent study published in April, I believe. The results came out in November in the press, but it was published in, in April by Dr. Bieta Kampman, um, Shabir Mahdi, a former um, member of this class who's now an expert in this, and, and many others, showing that a bivalent prefusion F vaccine in pregnancy prevented RSV disease in infants. And this is incredibly important. It's the first study in pregnant women to show such good efficacy. And the primary endpoints were medically attended RSV, LRTI, lower respiratory tract infection, and severe lower respiratory tract infection. I just mentioned this because the criteria for the study are different 
than the monoclonal antibody study. And so these studies cannot be directly compared. Even though people are directly comparing them all the time, you shouldn't because they're different endpoints. They say the same words, but their definitions are different. And here you can just see good vaccine safety. And here you can see the efficacy, the difference in the placebo group in blue to the RSV perfusion F group in gold. For on the left, um, one is... Um, Oh, any RS, severe RSV and medically attended RSV in the two graphs. You can see the blue line is really high. The yellow line is really low. You can do all the statistics you want, but it looks really good. And the primary endpoints, depending on the time after birth, 90 days. In this study, 82%, 180 days, almost 70%. This looks really good. Um, it is good. We have not, we have tried. I tried doing RSV vaccines back in the 1990s. We never got over 20%. I mean, we were we tried really hard. Pogli is informed Munoz and I. We tried. This is great. And adverse events, I just want to show you there's they looked for adverse events. There is a concern of preterm delivery. This this preterm delivery really was not statistically significant. It was a little bit higher. In, in the vaccine group. So there is concern, and I think more studies or perhaps post-licensure studies need to be done. And finally, going on to how to make an RSV-specific IgG antibody. This is so cool. This is like immunology 101 made simple for you guys, because for me, because I don't understand it, but I understand this. And what you do is you take an IgG1 antibody and you make several mutations, in the FC receptor, which is the red bars, and in the FAB receptors, which are the blue bars. And you, you're really smart about it because you're going to target it to the site zero of the prefusion antibody. And then you have an antibody that actually lasts a long time. And the reason it lasts a long time is it doesn't get eaten up in the endosomes of your body. It actually gets recirculated. It doesn't get degraded. It, it keeps on going and going. It's a gift that keeps on going for many months. Very nice. And the humanized F-protein antibody protects high-risk infants, we know from an existing monoclonal, palivizumab, and it's already licensed. And in the United States, it costs about $15,000 a course. It's prohibitively expensive, certainly unavailable for many most countries, but it works. And I think this proved an important point, that if you had an antibody against F-protein, you could protect babies from severe disease. Not infection, but severe disease. So now we have the studies from Nirsevimab, the brand new long-acting F pre-F protein monoclonal antibody. And using this, we've seen that a single dose prevents RSV in preterm babies on the left, and not only in preterm babies, but healthy late preterm, those over 35 weeks, and term babies up to 41 weeks on the right. And here you see the Nirsevimab. Here is the top line. The placebo is the blue line underneath. And what you can see is that there's really protection about 80% through six months of life. I'm, I'm simplifying all these studies, but it's amazing. This is really, really good. Um, and this is our Seattle celebration. I wanted to make sure I had time to show you. This is this is our RSV cake. Um, can you see it's a single-stranded negative strand RNA in the red and with little vials of vaccine or monoclonal antibody. A cake made by Alpana Wagmar, my colleague. And this is our team who we are... We are invested in, in antibodies, in vaccines, in whatever it takes to prevent disease in babies. And, and we're just so happy. We were so happy when all of our studies, we had about four studies, all come out all around the same time. And we had salmon tacos and RSV cake. It was great. Um, I just want to say, I'm going to show two more slides and I'll be done. Similar studies are underway and are so promising for group B strep vaccine, which is a very, very important vaccine, especially in countries that can't screen and give antibiotic prophylaxis. And I think it's really exciting to think that we're moving forward with group B strep vaccine. Um, this will be a polyvalent vaccine. We need to have it at least against four different valences of group B strep. strep. And in the latest study from 2021, it's against five or six valencies. And that's important so we could have the same vaccine worldwide because different places have different prevalences of the different um, GBS tapes. And this is a hexavalent. And then finally, SARS-CoV-2. I don't have time to talk about it. I have your slides are included in, in the talk. And I just want you to know that SARS-CoV-2 really needs to be included 
for pregnant women. It benefits the woman. It benefits the baby. We now have great studies on safety in the woman, safety in the baby, protection in the woman, protection in the baby. And the international studies continue to show that there is risk to pregnant women, risk to babies. And I'm just going to go down here to just show a study done by Elisa Kachikas in the back of the room showed that really the preterm babies born to the immunized women have great antibody titers. This is the cord spike IG, IgG. There's, she can tell you about the study, but you can see the preterm had similar antibody levels to the term when they got vaccinated at least twice during pregnancy. So, so the, the answer is people say, oh, you can't give it because they might be born preterm. Well, they can be born preterm, and if you have lots of antibody in the mother, the baby's going to get lots of antibody too. So with that, I'm going to just show you the COVID-19 vaccine policies on pregnancy. It's taken a long time and a lot of work by the WHO and other groups to really have countries consider or allow or recommend, recommend is the least, vaccination of pregnant women. And there's a lot of um, political, ideological practical and not scientific reasons for that. Um, but I just want to say we are now allowed to give pregnant women um, vaccination, at least 120 countries around the world. So last question here, why should a pregnant woman get a COVID-19 vaccine? You have to vote on this with your hands because I don't have a timer. To protect the woman against tetanus, to protect the woman from severe COVID-19 illness, to provide antibody to the baby, or because the vaccine is safe, effective in pregnant women. Okay, so you have A, B, C, D, and E. So how many say A? And if you do, I should fail. <laughs> I mean, you should give them a tetanus vaccine to protect against it. Okay, very good. I have succeeded. Okay, and how many say E, B, C, and D? Oh, this is great. I have succeeded. This is this is wonderful. With that, I just want to uh, thank you all for listening, and I'm here to answer questions for the next few minutes. And um, Hope you've enjoyed this tour of maternal vaccines. Thank you. Question. Let's see. One, just let me give one, two, three, four, five, and we'll, we'll go on from there. Okay. Thank you for that really wonderful presentation. Um, just in terms of how um, the timing of vaccination is decided in terms of which trimester, is it a decision based on you know, gestational growth and safety around antibody responses in gestation. How is that done? And are there trials? It is determined compared? by NITEGs and government regulations based on how risk averse they are. The more risk averse you are, the later you wait. It makes no sense. But in the United States, we, where's Elisa? In the United States, we recommend giving pertussis vaccine at 26 weeks. 28 to 32 in the United States. Whereas in other countries, I've heard in Australia, Where's Australia? It's 20 weeks, right? I mean, is that based on science? In my opinion, no. And should it be based on science? In my opinion, yes. Okay, next question. Um, I don't know. Yeah, um, I would like to learn more about uh, when you talk about each vaccines that have effect as a maternal immunization. But in real life, in low and middle income country, when you need to implement everything together, like influenza, um, RSV, COVID, and Tdap, how you're going to sequence it, or how is the importance of programmatic um, implementation in your view of how we put all together? Well, I think it's really yes. Yeah, so, so how do you put it all together? Especially, I mean, right now, if all we have is TD or Tdap, it's kind of simple if there's only one. And then as we move forward, I really think it depends on your country's epidemiology. What is your neonatal mortality? certainly the first three months of life with flu. In most countries, it's pretty low. In our studies in Nepal, Mali, and South Africa, the flu mortality was pretty low in the mothers and babies. And I would say, based on the studies we did and others have done, that the RSV mortality is pretty high. So if I were doing it in country, I would base it on um, risk benefit. And you're right, it would be very difficult to give four vaccines at the same time. But probably we could give three at the same time, if that's what we wanted to do. So for example, I would say that the mortality figures might be highest for tetanus and pertussis, RSV and group B strep. But we don't yet have group B strep vaccine. RSV vaccine is not widely available. So um, I think you have to, I think you're going to have to 
pick and choose for your country. A quick, a quick comment on that, because uh, almost all of the delivery in Thailand occur in hospital. Can we stop tetanus in mother? Can you? I think you can. We don't do it in the United States. But then you wouldn't get pertussis. So the question is, how much pertussis do you have out there? I do think it needs to be individualized for the country. And and could you make the DTAP vaccine for rural places? I think that's where we're going to have to be working very closely with our midwives, our OB colleagues, and the epidemiologists to see what's most important. Okay, next. These are great studies. No, you, I have three over here, I thought. I was just going to clarify what you had said before, um, the bit about um, pertussis vaccination in pregnancy. So we offer it from the second trimester in the UK, and that's because we have good data to show that the protection from second trimester is no different to the third trimester, and that there are data to show that. And one of the advantages of pushing it to the second trimester is that when they come in for the, for the ultrasound scans, uh, we can offer them the vaccine in clinic rather than trying to bring them back in the third trimester. And for that reason, we can achieve up to 70% uptake. So th th there is a reason why we... That, that is, I would call that a scientific reason. Yes. That is, and, and I'm saying some countries don't use a scientific reason. Yeah, you know, what I meant is, you know, there, what I was saying is yeah, one of the things was that actually we weren't getting a high uptake. So uh -huh. by showing that the protection is same in the second trimester, we were able to push it right. back to a, a meeting that they were coming to with healthcare, and that pushed our vaccine uptake up. Thank you. Yeah, that's why we changed to 20 weeks in Australia, was to coincide with the, the, norm, the routine scan at that time and helped with implementation, and we similarly have coverage about 85% now. Great. Okay. Who had the next question? Yes. Yeah, thanks, uh, Janet. Two questions. One is, I think you mentioned the maternal antibodies, IgG, right? Like it, it's increased uh, when it's a term baby, right? But in the preterm instances, like, is there certain instances where you have to kind of advise to get certain vaccination in preterm babies? That's one. And the second thing, I, I, I still quite didn't get your, um, the explanation around the need for uh, the at birth dose, mainly the OPV and the Hep B for a mother that's been fully vaccinated. So these are two questions. So the at birth dose would be for the baby. So yeah. babies can get at birth OPV. Of course, OPV induces antibody that's different than when, when you get an IPV. So at birth, we would give it to infants in, air, in countries that, that need it. Um, so I, I don't know. What don't you understand? Am I not being clear? <laughs> Uh, you're talking about the maternal antibodies, IgG, right? For a mother that's been fully vaccinated and received the full dose of polio or maybe the Hep B, right? Why well, you would you still have to give that? Uh, what's okay, the well, most of the mothers were immunized when they were babies. So the mothers, most mothers born who are giving birth today are 20 years old, and they have very low polio antibody. They have some. They have very low, actually, measles antibody. They have some. So we really want to... They have, they have low antibodies. So even if you get 100% of what the mothers have, it may not be enough to protect them from polio. If you gave the vaccine, if you gave the mother IPV during pregnancy, which in the past Finland has done and other countries have done, then you might not need to give it to the baby at birth. But in most countries, nobody's giving pregnant women polio vaccine. Okay. And, and the preterm the question? Preterm. Um, preterm babies, you should consider, especially under 30 weeks gestation, the babies don't get enough antibody to protect them. And that's why we really, and we will talk about that, we really need to immunize preterm babies as soon as they are able, which is usually using the same EPI schedule, 6, 10, 14, because they need the vaccine even more than a term baby. Okay. I forget who I said next. Okay. Good morning. Wonderful presentation. I was just wondering, because we're going to implement now, we had a participant 20, at 22 weeks in Holland, and we will get to maturing of flu finally. Um, and COVID, of course, and then RSV, we're already talking about that. But I was just wondering, are there studies or need there be done more studies to see what happens if you get the vaccines together, you know, in one session or in two sessions? Because, you know, getting initiating fever in a pregnant woman is giving a hazard on um and maybe from all the distance uh studies we know 
that on the individual vaccine it doesn't happen. But if you give them together, what might So happen? I think that's true. And I think yeah. many some studies have been done in other patient populations, and we should look at that. For example, elderly RSV vaccine with pre-fusion F, they've given flu and RSV together. There's no fever with flu, there's no flu fever with RSV, and there's no fever with it together. I would probably take COVID out of that equation, but I think I think that's it, those studies need to be done. They can some of those could be done as a phase four study as opposed to a phase three study. To to I, I see an urgent need to prevent RSV disease, not just in my country but around the world. RSV is a killer, so I think those studies could be done. And certainly in many countries, women are seen every two weeks, so we could still give a vaccine every two weeks if that's what we wanted to. So we've got to be clever, innovative. We've got to collect data. We've got to do prospective studies, but they don't have to be all these double blind placebo controlled calling the mother as we did every half week and week and every day after the vaccine. Those studies are so incredibly labor intensive and difficult. We don't have to maybe do that, but we can, we can use innovative approaches to follow this kind of reactions. Okay. There. Great. Thanks so much. So, so how do we integrate maternal RSV vaccination with the use of nursivimab and sort of what gets us there? What studies are being done with both together separately? Who needs one? Who needs the other? That is so simple. None. <laughs> there's none and there's no efforts yet being made. And I think until things are licensed, they won't be done, at least in the United States. The big effort I think needs to be in integrating our immunization registry so that we actually can can collect data on monoclonal antibodies because at least in my location we collect vaccine data and we don't collect antibody data. So I think it's a that's what group our group yesterday tried to say and we were knocked down by the public health minister back there because we didn't have it. That is there, there's a lot a lot a lot of work ongoing on that and I cannot possibly address that in 30 seconds. So I'm not going to try. Okay, can can you at least sort of no. uh, speculate? All right. I, I, I just, I can't. Okay. I mean, it's just, it's way too complicated. But if we don't have a registry, then we won't know who got what. And that's, I think, important. And and I do think that if the companies are not going to do the study. The governments need to do the studies. So, okay, let's see. The back row. Thank you. I have a question. If I understood your lecture correctly, um, you're saying that the protection from the mother to the infant, some of it is antigen specific, like for RSV. But some of it, the antibodies are not antigen specific, like for measles. Is that the case? No, that's not the case. So is it are all of them antigen specific? For what we know so far, for the vast majority, and there's some exceptions. One is Chagas disease and a few other things that I haven't even talked about. But for the most part, we are talking about antibody protection. We also think there's some T cell and some other um, anti-idiotypic antibody, such as Chagas disease, might have anti-idiotypic antibody that may prevent it, but I didn't have time to talk about that. But for measles, we are in, in general, we are not transmitting cellular immunity. We are transferring antibody immunity. So I understand that. But what I'm saying is that these antibodies, they are specific to these particular antibodies. They are. They are. Okay. Okay. One more question. Okay. In the back row there. Uh, thank you very much. As you said that uh, in pregnancy, OPV is not given. But uh, the people living in endemic zone, when they travel to other countries, uh, OPV is given to all ages. Is it safe in pregnancy? Yes. And can that protect a uh, uh, baby too? Thank you. Well, that uh, protecting the baby, I don't know. But we have had, it's so great that we have history. So there are lots, not lots, but there are multiple studies where OPV has been given to the entire country. Finland, I don't know if Hannah is here, but Finland is an example of they had an outbreak maybe 30 years ago, and the whole country got OPV. Israel is another example where the whole country got OPV. We have good data that it's safe for the woman, but they didn't just give it to the woman. They also immunized the baby once the baby was born. So I don't I don't think myself that OPV alone given to the mother is going to confer enough protection on the baby. I would also immunize the baby at birth and certainly at six weeks. But I do not know of a study where they just immunized the mother and then waited to see if the baby got polio, because that would be a little bit unethical. A lot unethical. Okay. 
And I have a question from John online. But it's working now. So, question from John, who's on the golden cage upstairs. So, uh, beyond preterm labor and birth, what adverse events are on one side for public health and medical providers, on the other side for, for the general public, concerns about regarding near CVMAB and the subunit RSV vaccine? Let me read that again. Could you repeat it? Yeah. Beyond preterm labor and birth, what adverse events are? One, public health and medical medical providers, and two, general public concerned about regarding nirsevimab and the subunit RSV vaccine. Okay. Well, for nirsevimab, we're, we have no concerns because the studies have been done in preterm babies and in term babies. And it never is given to the mother. So I think there's no concern about the mother for nirsevimab. Okay. For RSV vaccines, of course, there is concerns about safety. And that's why we have good safety data in the single study done in about 4,000 women, of which half got the vaccine. But we don't just have that study. We also have the Novavax vaccine study, which I didn't talk about, which similarly showed, showed good safety. But do we have enough evidence on safety? My opinion is we need to keep on collecting data. I believe it doesn't have to be done in a phase three very regimented study. We should be collecting that in a phase four population-based study and see how that happens because we need big numbers. To look for rare adverse events, you need sample sizes of 100,000, not not 10,000 or 1,000. So, John, we need to do more studies. The question that people ask me is, so does that mean we should delay vaccination implementation? And my answer is no. We we have babies dying all the time. I just want to say I had a baby die February 28th this year. And, and you, you know, everybody goes, oh, yeah, you had a baby die. But it's terrible. It's just terrible. And I, I'm a pediatrician. I take care of kids. I don't want to keep on waiting. I, I really don't. It doesn't happen that much. I'm being emotional. Okay. But still, I don't want to keep on waiting. Um, there's lots of these babies full-term healthy babies that get really sick. And if they didn't have a ventilator or an ECMO, they would die. And in places where they don't have that, they are dying. So I would like to continue and do some more post-marketing good studies. So thank you very much.